Hi everyone, I'm Krista Seiden, Analytics Advocate at Google. And I'm Lewis Gray, Analytics Advocate at Google. Welcome to our eighth episode of Measure Matters. Today, we're gonna to talk about measurement for PR professionals. So let's dive right in and look at our agenda. First, we'll go over what we talked about last time on Measure Matters. We'll talk about what's new in the analytics space, the word on the street, and then our big topic, which again is measurement for PR. So previously on Measure Matters, we talked about Data Studio as our big question and our big topic. And we had a special guest, Mary Pishney, who joined us. She's a product manager on Data Studio. And we had a really great conversation about all of the different use cases and a lot of what's new in Data Studio. So if you didn't check that out, definitely follow that link uh, and look at that previous episode. You'll also hear about some of the things that we were new last time, such as commonly used metrics and dimensions in Google Analytics, as well as some of the other things that we're very excited about, which mostly was Data Studio. Absolutely. <laughs> and we talk about Data Studio every single episode, but last week was special deep dive. Yep. All right. So what is new this time around? So first up, shareable certificates in Analytics Academy. So we know that you are excited to complete those Analytics Academy courses. We're excited for you. And now you can tell the world. In fact, I've already seen several of these on social media. I believe the one for our new course, which I'm about to tell you about, is green. Yep. Uh, so I've seen a lot of those come through. So congratulations. Uh, definitely share away and let everybody know that you've passed these Analytics Academy courses. And these are no easy piece of cake. You know, you really have to have done your homework, studied up, watch the videos and engage. And I, I like to think that Measure Matters helps a little bit. Yeah, So if you've sure. been watching our shows, you've already got a leg up uh, on the competition, really. Yep. All right, next up, that new Analytics Academy course that I just hinted at, Google Analytics for Power Users. So I'm really excited about this one because it's gonna help you gain deeper analysis skills all around. It's our first expert level course, and it's actually formatted a little bit differently than previous courses. So if you've started to take it, you'll notice uh, there's a lot of hands-on, um, I'm actually in the product showing you how to do various things and really get deep in that analysis uh, to take your skills to the next level. So if you haven't checked it out, definitely do. Go practice those advanced and ana analytic skills um, and get that shiny certificate to share on social media. All right, last in our What's New section is easier Search Console access for analytics owners. So what is it? Well, it's easier integrations. Uh, we're launching auto verification. So you don't have to manually configure Search Console for analytics anymore. This is great. Uh, it's really gonna help you get started with Search Console and that integration much easier. And uh, just a note, to be eligible for auto verification, you do still need to follow the existing requirements for Search Console ownership. You can find more details in that blog post that's linked at the bottom of your screen. And this is one of those little simple things that's really important that our users have asked for for a long time. You know, we have a lot of webmaster tools out there. So for those of you who manage sites, measure sites, you should be getting this all in one place and we should be knowing it's you when you get there. So I'm for happy sure. to see this launch. Yep. And so that brings us to the word on the street. Yep. You, know, you talked about sharing on social. I get to see those shares. It's a lot of fun. I think every single day I log on, I see people celebrating the fact that they've passed the academy courses and really taken the leg up in their career. But we also see a lot of helpful how-to tips as people go through and they get excited and talk about mm -hmm. Data Studio. Alayda Solis really wrote an excellent report on Data Studio as a Search Console dashboard. She really dove di uh, deep into the piece talking about Search Console integration and the connectors that are there. So you can get the data that you're looking for in a smart and an analytical way. So now, instead of having to make a custom report every single time, you simply put up in Data Studio and you can pull down any of the sites that you measure across the same metrics that are already set. Absolutely, use this as a template with your own data. I saw Alita tweet this out, she was super excited about it. There was a lot of excitement around that. Um, so definitely check it out, uh, give it a look, and hopefully you guys find some value there. Absolutely. And one of these, I loved this headline, what's the hype with Google Analytics? And what's up with kids these days? <laughs> you know, and the author really went deep dive into the digital marketing piece and what you really need as analytics is the number one tool that you can use to analyze your digital marketing and let you know really is your online business going well? I thought she explained it exceptionally well, talking about observing the entire journey of the customer. And if you're an e-commerce site, you should know how amazing it is to work with. So Anamika, really thank you for putting that one out. And that was a lot of fun to share out in the world. And that brings us to the big question, measurement for PR. You know, Chris and I come up here every couple of weeks and we talk about what's going on with the product. What I also wanna make sure that we do is we talk from your perspective. How are you using it? What are the benefits that you gain from it? 
And in my career, I think I've passed the point where I say how many years, because then I just start to feel like it's been a long time. Uh, but I've managed to be on the PR side either pitching or having been pitched for mm -hmm. years, right? Yeah. Uh, I've written thousands of blog posts, I've broken news, I've had to break news and actually call those reporters on the other side and say, this is important. And here's the reality in journalism, it's changing. And so it used to be that someone like Krista or myself could take an entire day or multiple days to work on a story. But now people are writing two, three, four stories a day, really quickly getting that story out. Yeah. So what does that mean for you as a public relations professional? means you need to get their attention and you need to make it easier for them to complete their story. And sometimes the way that you can do that is with data. And so we're going to talk a little bit about some real important pieces on it. Yep. And uh, Willis, before we jump in, I know that we both talked to audiences before about this topic. Mm -hmm. um, I know, you know, there's a conference called PR News that comes to mind. Right. Uh, I've spoken at a couple, you've spoken at a couple. I feel like this is an often requested topic from our audience. And I'm really excited that we're actually going to share a lot more broadly about this topic. Sure. And I think when it comes down to it, you know, we have a number of audiences that you and I get too often. We get analysts, marketers, public relations, and this is part of the circuit. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like rather than just sharing it with a small group repeatedly, let's tell the world. And then we have a baseline for that story and we get to continue to build on it. Uh, and so here we are sharing it with you and you can take it on YouTube and go beyond. Also... Did you really say that you've written thousands of blog posts? Yes. Uh, the, the downside is they were pretty much all before I joined Google. We've been kind of busy here since I showed up. But 3,000 blog posts uh, oh from gosh. 2006 to 2011. So I was literally doing two a day, every single day, and not getting paid for it. It was just a real fun hobby. That's a lot of work. I've done somewhere in the low hundreds, and mm -hmm. I feel like that's a lot. I think you have a higher quality filter than I do then. All right. So let's talk about some truths. Here's the reality. When you're in public relations, the idea that activity itself was enough is no longer true. And you should be getting credit for everything you do. What you do is measurable. You and your client who you work with, if you're a third party agency, get to decide what to measure. That data will inform your decisions, it will get you closer to your users and help you deliver reports that show results. And I show this quote a lot. Uh, John Wanamaker really kind of put it out there and said, you know, the, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted, the trouble is I don't know which half. Now this might have been true over a hundred years ago when he said it, but it's not true anymore. And Google Analytics and Google Ads and all of our different platforms will help you get those answers. And the world changes quickly. You know, I put this up and I still, when I talk to audiences, they say, well, I still do this. Well, hold on. If you're still doing clipping books and you're still asking to do article reprints and you're still trying to do embargoes, I understand. Some different industries don't move at the same pace. But what I have observed over the last 10 to 15 years of engaging with marketing PR is these things have disappeared. It used to be that we would have a press push and we would wrap up all of the articles that got written about us in a hardbound book and literally hand deliver it to the people on our board of directors. Or we would give it to our senior managers and you would go into their office and there would be whoosh, Q1 2003. Marty. But who's going to open that book up, right? Like, who's ever going to read that thing? Like, I'm glad it was thick and okay. Uh, but the reality is that things have moved on. Things are really quick. You remember a time before Twitter? You know, Twitter just passed their 10th anniversary, I mm -hmm. think it was. Some of us might have been on there that long. And it's instant. And so we're getting to the point where a story that happened this morning is old news by afternoon and yesterday's news by this evening. And so that means as a PR person, you have to understand what is important. What can you derive from your activity? How can it have staying power? And how do you get through the noise? So this is one thing I used to show about how we'd measure the PR impact. We used to have kind of our OKRs, right? So my OKR would be, you want to have one publication cover you every single quarter. You want to get 15 press hits. I want 10 of them to be in verticals. and I want five of them to be in horizontal publications. That sounds a lot like what I was asked to do. Mm -hmm. And so when we would get that done, we would take a look and say, did our executives get quoted? I want to have two focuses with our CEO, and I want them to show up and say, InfoWorld in the Wall Street Journal. And when we would get that done, we'd be able to put a link on the website with a logo and check that box. But hold on a second. I didn't find out whether that drove us any website traffic. I didn't find out if that drove us any leads. Mm -hmm. and I didn't find out how much revenue we got from that. That sounds like a gap to me. Yeah. And so when we talk about going through the entire customer journey and measurement all the way through, you have to find the thing that's going to measure correctly and have impact on your real business. Here's another example back in my day. She's already mocking me. <laughs> so we used to have this situation where you have a big industry press target and then medium kind of as your backup. And so if I had a big story, if Krista's going to launch 
Data Studio 2.0, right? No promises, by the way, we're just a, a suggestion. <laughs> if she's gonna do this, then I wanna make sure that it's gonna get in our target. And so we're gonna pitch them and we're gonna give them a unique story and say, you're okay with going with this live. And if they don't want to, we should have a backup. And so this is what we would legitimately do. We would have a story and make sure every story got covered and every press piece covered us at least once. That's what we had to do. But things are changing, you have to go faster. Sometimes you, what they call spray and pray, which is where you take the story and send it everywhere. But the only way to know if you're doing the right thing is if you follow this path. And that's a path to knowing what the business objectives are, knowing what the business strategy is. And before you step back and go, hold on, we're a third party agency. We're not really in the world of sales. Yes, you are. <laughs> there are two types of employees. One is sales and one is engineering. Chris and I, sometimes we pretend to be engineers, we're in sales, right? Our effort is to help people understand what the product's all about and get it to that next level. And so you have to identify the key stakeholders. Who cares? Who's measuring for you? Who's gonna pay your check the next time you ask for one? And set the right KPIs to get that correct. I like to consider myself a marketer. We are marketers, but when you look at the big picture, if you have to choose one, most marketers are in the sales category. You know, we do talk to engineers, we like them a lot. And sometimes we find issues with the product that we wanna make better or we have some product designs. Sure. But, you know. Okay, I'm a that, technical marketer. That's good. <laughs> Sales engineer is kind of that hybrid, right? Oh, okay. So back to you, know, you go back to GA360, and we talk to a lot of people about where they measure their campaigns and when do they come up with the concept of how to measure. And although about half are correctly deciding how to measure during the campaign strategy, the other half are not. Now, if you're on this Measure Matters broadcast, I'm pretty sure you're not in that 16% who don't measure it at all and just do stuff. I don't know what company that is. Uh, number one, part of me is a little jealous, but on the other hand, I don't think it would work for very long. Sadly, I think it's a lot of companies still. A lot of companies still. Well, 16% is a lot of a big group. Uh, but when, you, when you're in the process of doing this campaign, often you'll be in a situation where you're making amazing ad copy or beautiful ads, and you'll hold on a second. Where are these ads going to go? What does this landing page look like? Are we going for leads or are we going for revenue? Are we going for clicks? And so you have to understand what are those interactions that matter? How quickly can we spot the key insights into this data so it's not just noise? And how do we do the next level thing and turn those insights into results? I think about a month or a month and a half ago, you and I talked about Salesforce integrations. Mm -hmm. yep. And I think that's a key piece to understand when you're looking at the PR funnel and when you're starting to bring visitors into your website and starting to bring activity at external uh, publications, they will turn into leads, which go into that Salesforce funnel and get tracked all the way through. Yeah, and you know, um, I like this chart because it really, it, it speaks to the importance of doing all of this ahead of time. But I have to tell you, I have been in several businesses, no matter how hard I try to tell them to do it ahead of time, that it comes down to, we launched this thing and now we need to know the impact. And when the impact doesn't meet the stated goals, well, then it's a brand campaign because mm -hmm. that's less measurable. Um, but that's not a situation you want to find yourself in. So do make sure that you make every effort to get your tracking in place before you start pushing these campaigns out. Right. And that's not to discount brand campaigns. There are, <laughs> there's a whole generation of brand marketing that's out there that's important. Absolutely. So I put this as a key point, and this comes up a lot when I'm speaking to audiences. They'll say, well, hold on a second, Lewis. I can't even get to their analytics. They won't let me, they don't trust me. Okay, that's a problem, right? You need to be able to have access to the analytics of the client or your company where you work to be able to measure properly. If they are not giving you access to that analytics, what kind of partnership is that? You've gotta get that access. And even at the next level, if they're not willing to give you carte blanche analytics access, make sure you work with them to make a data studio report that is shareable that you can optimize and go ahead and measure and analyze in the right way. Even better, if you are an agency in this uh, situation, hopefully you have a data studio template already that you are used to measuring from that's gonna help you really deliver all of these key insights around the success of these campaigns to your clients. In fact, it could even be part of your pitch to these clients is that you have this unified reporting and across the board for all of your clients, you can measure uh, baseline versus how well uh, this particular campaign is doing. And a quick plug for the Data Studio Gallery. You know, the Data Studio Gallery is the external place where we can showcase some of the best Data Studio reports and templates, mm -hmm. and we hope to see yours in there. So let's talk about the information journey. I mentioned earlier the PR funnel and where you are. The PR funnel at the pick, at the pick point where you are in the customer journey is very early. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at this entire modern customer journey, where you have an initial click and you have some social engagement and some paid search, 
PR is on the left side. It gets the air cover, the awareness of your product or your story, and then the customer is gonna to come to the website and take some actions. Mm -hmm. And so in some cases, you're kind of doing a handoff, right? You yep. get a customer interest and you hand it off to the website. Hopefully the website can convert. But you have to understand that. It's very challenging to come from a piece of coverage that's say in Information Week or the New York Times and go, well, what sales did we get out of that? Yep. It takes a few hops and it absolutely takes some time as well. But many PR pros stress out about data. This is something that many of us as advocates have talked about for a long time. You shouldn't stress out about data. Not only is it fun and creative and impresses people, but it improves your results. And so if you can measure that you actually delivered a real impact, they will give you more money. Not only will you sustain the business you have, you might be able to hire more AEs, right? And so we've had this scenario where we can prove that we turn marketing or PR into a, instead of a cost center, but like a profit center, it's transformative. And so there's many different uses of data for PR pros, but the two top ones I wanna talk about are first, reporting and decision making. We've talked about Data Studio for a bit, but this is how you calculate and quantify your results. Here's what happened, what stories got traction, and what are the changes over time? And the second, which is my favorite at this point, is storytelling and visualization. So let's go back to what I said at the beginning of this presentation, is that more reporters are writing more stories, stories every day. And so you need to find a way to pop through that story and actually give them a graph or a chart that they can work with and put as their story. One of the uh, charts you have on here, this one, it just makes me laugh every time. Mm -hmm. The Flash had seven years. I think this Flash is from the OkCupid okay blog, right? It is. OkCupid okay <laughs> actually looked at all this analysis, and you would have people who would take their selfies, mm -hmm. you know, and you would have a flash on or you wouldn't. And if you had a flash on, the estimated age of the person whose photo was in that uh, profile was seven years higher than if they did not have the flash on. I never use flash anymore because of this study. <laughs> I think if you want to look older, go for it. Uh, <laughs> but if you don't, turn the flash off. And that's what it tells you. And that alone, you know, we're here talking about it. Uh, that's the type of thing that can get a storyline going. And it's just straightforward. You get it right away. Uh, yeah. And if you're on a dating site and you want to make that change, whether you want to look 33 <laughs> or 40, you know, make a call. So I have a couple examples here. One is with flowing data. You know, they take data visualization projects that graduate numbers to stories that eyes can get at a glance. You know, this is a, a real fun one, which is cause of death by year. <laughs> so, you know, if you're a certain age, well, what's the most likely cause of death for you? And, and you can see over time as you get older, you know, things like circulatory, uh, cancer, respiratory go up, uh, whereas often if you're younger, it's an accident of some kind. So isn't this nice and uplifting? Let's move on. Um, second piece, New York Times. Uh, New York Times, maybe this is also hard for you, giving a, you're a San Francisco resident, but talking about renting versus owning. Oh. You know, based on what geography you're in, how much you pay per month, they were able to take some data and really show you what makes sense. Because a lot of people have that debate. You know, do I need to buy? a big chunk of money, a big chunk of land, own it myself, or should I just continue doing rent and not get the equity? I can tell you that I can definitely not rent in San Francisco for less than $1,183 a month. So I am That's throwing my, right. way, my money away on rent is what you're telling me. It, well, yeah, it depends <laughs> how small your place is. But yeah, 1183 a month, that's, uh, that's a good deal in SF, but I don't know what that place looks like. And then, you know, I want to have you guys understand the many types of tools that Google has available. This is not an analytics pitch show. Uh, you know, we were talking about the different tools you can use at Google, and one of them is Google Trends. You know, I obviously, a lot of times on social, people confuse the two between Google Trends and Google Analytics, and that happens. Uh, but really what Trends is all about is seeing what the world is searching. And so I'll use a couple examples here. One of these is baseball versus football. Now, I understand if you're on one side of the pond, football might mean soccer. Uh, or if you're football on this side, it's the American football. But there's a lot of seasonality difference. And if you look at Google Trends, what it shows you is baseball kind of hangs in there and goes along during the actual season. And football is ahead of baseball every single month. Now that hurts me as a baseball person, but it's just, those are the facts. Uh, but when the American football kicks up, it really spikes at the very beginning of the season when every team is undefeated. And then as they start to lose and fall out of playoff contention, people search for football less and less. You know, my other hypothesis here is that there are so few football games compared to baseball games that who really wants to talk about all 100 and whatever number of baseball games? She means 162 games. <laughs> yeah, 162 games, which are all very important to watch, Krista, all of them. Okay. And then you have a different one, which is correlated, which is sunglasses versus sandals. Now, the first time I did this presentation, I was in Miami. So, I don't know, maybe my head was at the beach. But it's not a big surprise that searches for sunglasses and sandals have almost the exact same pattern. As the weather gets warmer, people search for both. 
And if you have a big spike, like there's this blue spike here for sunglasses. Now, I'm gonna make a quick guess. I'm going to guess that this was during that, so that total, total solar eclipse, <laughs> yeah. right? And people were worried about, you know, what can I look at with my eyes covered or not, and that was the one-time spike. Mm -hmm. And that in itself tells a story. And so what I'm trying to get at is imagine your own industry that you own, that you talk about every day. What are the type of searches and type of trends that you can look up that become a story that you can write about? There's also another tool from Google, and this one's really new, and this is called the Consumer Barometer. The Consumer Barometer attempts to show you how buying behaviors and shopping behaviors happen globally. And you can cut down by country and by specific questions, including you know, how many device types do they use or where do they make an actual purchase. So for example, a lot of people find out about products because they've already bought it and so they continue to buy it. That's where brand loyalty is huge. Or they find out with other people, you know, Krista, if, if I want to go out and buy a new shaving cream, you know, I'm going to ask a friend, you know, what are you going to do? And you go out and you, you buy it and you pick a brand that you like and you go with it. Uh, or you do research online. And I thought this was silly, uh, super interesting. You know, you look at um, which devices do people use to make their purchase, it's still the computer. Mm -hmm. And so while content consumption and even creation is really happening on smartphones more and more and more, when people want to make a purchase, they get back to the laptop, back to the PC, and that's where they buy. And in this case, it was 92% of households. In this case, it was Japan that I was looking at, uh, where they make purchases using the computer as opposed to a smartphone or tablet. Which is interesting considering how smartphone forward Japan is in general. Yes. But I have to agree. I mean, most purchases I probably still make on my computer. The exception would be when I have like a really good app, like an Amazon mm -hmm. or something like Absolutely. that. But for the most part, a computer is much easier. Yeah. Might be a generational thing, I don't know. It could be. And Maybe over, younger buyers aren't buying as much yet. We'd have to check out the consumer barometer to find out exactly. But you know, <laughs> that's the type of thing where you look at a story and you say, although you know the usage is very high for smartphones, the actual consumption or the, the, the actual commerce transaction takes place on the PC. Yep. That in itself is a story. And so you think about where you live in your, your uh, demographic and all the stuff you're doing, you can go ahead and take a look and make your own story. There's also one piece I talk about, which is tracking your pitches with the campaign URL builder. This is an old standby. You know, if you want to understand exactly how your links are working, instead of just emailing everybody the exact same link and hoping it comes through right, you should be able to make a custom campaign and separate it by target. You know, if you want to get Wall Street Journal, you know, where did that go? The campaign type, the date and the subject, just measure, adjust and repeat. I can't stress this enough. This is still to this day one of my top analytics tips for any industry or any practice, but especially for PR. You should always be doing this so that you can get the credit for the work that you're putting in. Absolutely. And so real quick, you guys know analytics inside and out. So why use it? It's real simple. Track the results. You know, Identify who the target customers are, uh, target users. Increase the conversions by optimizing your landing pages, and we've obviously talked a lot about Google Optimize as well, mm -hmm. and maximizing the entire conversion through the customer journey. And you can also value and analyze the media generated so that once you start to look at all those referral URLs and you find out exactly how much did Twitter deliver for you, what came from TechCrunch, what came from the Wall Street Journal or ESPN, depending on where you are, you'll know what sites convert the best, which ones send consistent traffic all the time, and which ones spike based on specific campaigns. And that will tell you exactly what happens when you make those pitches. And so when you've used the campaign URL builder, you can go through and see how the campaign is converting and, the, and see the results over time. And so that's it. You know, we want to talk real quick about public relations and understand how you can get credit for the work that you're already doing. And you know, we're not going to go deep in exactly specifically every single piece of GA, but use the tools. That's why they're there. Uh, leverage Google Trends. Uh, make your own data and write your own stories. Ultimately, it's about getting the credit for all the work you're putting in. So definitely measure it. Um, so with that, I guess we will go ahead and wrap up. So connect with us on uh, any social media platform of your choice. Uh, hashtag measure matter. Measure matters uh, on Twitter. You can follow us at Google Analytics just about anywhere. I'm at Krista Seiden at Lewis Gray on Twitter. Our next episode is going to be September 19th, and we're going to cover Advanced Analysis, which is a new analysis platform within Google Analytics, specifically for Google Analytics 360 customers, but really, really cool functionality. And we're going to show you how you can go deep in there and learn to use those techniques and some of the types of analysis that you can really tease out of there. So stay connected with us 
Uh, check out our playlist if you've missed any of our previous episodes. And thank you so much for joining us today.